the earlier announcement. My name, <laughs> Vicki Yamsomarez, and I am a Maidu from Northern California, Mihai Koyankawi Maida, and I'm wanting to thank Moortown Rancheria for their very generous donation of rare storybooks and also to this group of community members coming from our home country. Up next will be Janice Uhl, who is also Pongkau, and she will be sharing her contemporary poetry, which is a twist on storytelling today. So thank you, Janice. Please welcome her. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Well, I'd like to thank Cora English for this uh, invitation to NMAO. It's an honor to be here and to read here. Um, and it's been a wonderful program. The music's great, uh, storytelling. Um, and then there's some beautiful exhibits here as well. And Kay Watkins, if you haven't seen it, please go up and look at it. It's just amazing work. Um, I'm going to read from a couple of books of poetry that I've written, Earthquake Weather and Doubters and Dreamers. And um, I'm going to start with a poem called Outside Language. This poem has an epigraph by the poet June Jordan, African-American poet. And she said, we are not all that is possible. None of us has ever really experienced justice. None of us has known enough tenderness. When my mother's soul slipped through the brief disappearing O of her mouth, I saw her speak the language they say only newborns or the dead can speak, murmured words of greeting and farewell. I felt her slip away, a presence just beyond my apprehension. I wondered why I couldn't go too because this material world meant nothing to me. I understood that things stay together through our vigilance. If I let the boundaries fail for a moment, I'd begin to fall past the ground that shores us up, through the roots of trees, beds of lava and flint, clear to the other side of the universe. The first morning without my mother, it rained. That was a sign. And the world was suddenly with me, vivid and palpable. I could feel the weight of history drag at my feet. But something poured into me like music. And I knew she wanted me to accept my own fate, the fulfillment of the life she gave me. And I felt the words that came from the other side of memory and knowledge. They had less to do with justice than tenderness, less to do with love than courage. The Day of the Dead. I wish it were like this. El Dia de los Muertos comes and we fill our baskets with bread, apples, chicken, and beer, and go out to the graveyard. We bring flowers with significant colors, yellow, crimson, and gold, the strong, hungry colors of life full of saliva and blood. We sit on the sandy mounds and I play my accordion. It groans like the gates of hell. The flames of the votives flicker in the wind. My music makes everything sway, all the visible and invisible, friends, candles, ants, the wind. Because for me, life ripens, and for now it's on my side. Though it's true, I'm often afraid. I wear my boots when I play the old squeeze box and stomp hard rhythms till the headstones dance on their graves. This energy in which we exist the poem is for Joy Harjo. Somehow it is true, this energy in which we exist, like the force of music that streams into and out of our hearts, 
the muscle itself clenching, releasing, converting one thing into another, anger into hatred, hatred into blood, blood into love. And none of this easy to explain, none of this possible in isolation, though in isolation it happens too. Because we are shaped by a harmony that is at once terrible and wonderful, assonant and dissonant. One moment a masked deity, the next a water monster swimming the crest of a wave. One moment we are smoke, the next fire, now a war, an infant, a hand, a kiss, a breath, bird, or sunlight. We are something that comes from nothing, nothing from something. Who knows how long each of us hoped to enter this world. So much potential waiting to be fulfilled. Magic is this at the center of things. I was a rabbit curled at the bottom of a silk hat. Then something seized me, lifting me from this envelope. I sloughed off the skin of that other life. Now I see how we must decide, how we must make a choice. We think we are limited, but forms are tricky things. At the level where hearts dissolve, maps have no meaning. Anguish and love drive us ceaselessly from one existence to the next. Questions about the soul. I have questions about the soul who resides like a dark cousin in the shadow of my heart. I remember her black curly hair, the almond shape of her eyes, and her small mouth turned down at the edges. Her voice could not reach her mother. When she rattled the cage of her crib, her mother sang louder. Here in this photo, pudgy and laughing, she is dressed in a crocheted sweater. She was a brown, sturdy baby, but her little boots are dirty. Where did she live, this soul? With whom did she take her supper? Did she sleep in a solitary room? Did she know her father? Perhaps her mother had beaten her. I heard that she ran away. They say she grew up mean and took many unruly lovers. I have questions about the soul, how she survived her sorrow, whether she could love, or if she hated her sons and daughters. I have questions about the soul who resides like history in my heart's dark chamber. A lot of uh, my work um, rests in family history and tribal history and in relationships with the people I love. So I'm going to write, read uh, four little poems that are um, elements. Wind. What can I say about someone who, bare, who touches my bare feet gently, then fingers the curly down on my legs and arms, and finally ruffles the hair at the crown of my head, a gesture I'd never let another try. But wind, she's OK. She whispers a little in my left ear, the right one, brushes my upper lip. Then she sends a cloud to give me a chill. She's up there somewhere performing interesting magic, enticing the elements to come together, the hydrogen twins with the oxygen girl, maybe even getting a flicker of electricity out of the thunderheads gathering to the south, hoping they'll spark a fire. The freest soul I know, she can shove us around or caress us in the most unusual ways. She is certainly exciting, but what do I really know about wind? Stones. Cold and pensive, you make a habit of silence. Yet, in extremity, earthquake, avalanche, you call out in a jumble of voices amplified by cliffs and the plummeting fall. 
cautious, shifting slowly, you cherish the sedentary, congregating in fields and on riverbanks. You sleep promiscuously, content to be with others of your kind, roughened, rounded, or flat. In your dense, quiet lives, you are admirably stoic and remote. When shattered, you try to preserve your dignity and resist unearthing, yet yield graciously, generously, to the inevitable dust. Clouds. Shapeshifters and travelers, you often journey en masse. In one day or one night, you cover great distances, moving and changing, disappearing forever. You like that circus life, the acrobatics of choosing what to become, a dog, an elephant, a leaping porpoise. You accept the ways in which the wind builds you up, then breaks you down until you are wisps, smears, ragged wings. Torn or solitary, you become mist or fog, hovering in canyons, drifting in ravines, indistinct, even to yourselves. At your most annihilated, you find yourselves gathering again, piling up like husks of bark or a heap of rabbit skins. You take on faith that heat or cold, wind or water, will bring you together or tear you apart. Creek. Beneath the thump and cascade of water, under the gulp and pound, where rocks get worn down, ancestors are singing. Those who were here so long ago, our memory of them is only music. You protect those old ones, disguising their chorus with your own drumming, a sound like faint applause. You give the singers caverns for their melodies, passages and pools for their slow reverberations. At times, we hear their laughter, lament, voices calling, for the ceremonies have existed since the first sun ascended. Somewhere beneath your depths, they live, they continue, unseen, unknown, except by the oozel, darting between rocks, by the kingfisher swooping along your surface, or by the river otters who bark and dance to the mysterious tunes. Well, thank you for being here. I'm going to read one uh, more piece. It's a little short story called Engine Car. The woman is probably in her mid-30s. When she calls, her voice is hoarse and agitated, and no sooner than I say hello, she informs me in a rush, that car you sold me broke down. I'm standing in the vestibule of my family home, about to sit down to dinner. Everyone has assembled in the dining room where the meal, a big pan of lasagna, is steaming. My dad is holding up a serving spoon and looking at me inquisitively. It was an old car, I answer hesitantly. I have no money to fix that thing, declares the woman, her voice rising. I can't even have it towed. Will you give me back my hundred dollars? Oh, I stall, gosh. I remember how quickly it had happened. She and a lanky blonde guy looked under the hood. Then they both climbed in the station wagon with her behind the wheel. They were gone a few minutes, driving around her neighborhood by Mary Magdalene Church, testing the car. I was surprised at her disheveled appearance. Her forehead was creased, her black hair looked uncombed. I wondered if the blonde was her lover. When she finished driving the car, she handed me two $50 bills, and I gave her the pink slip. I didn't know it would break down, I stammer. I'm sorry. It has been three days since the woman called in response to the ad I placed in the penny saver, which read, 1972 Datsun Stash station wagon for sale, still runs $100 OBO. 
I had explained on the phone that the 12-year-old car had a lot of miles on it, that I was selling it as is. My sister drove the car down from Alaska, I had told her, and she bought it secondhand up there. It's had a long life, I warned, but it's still kicking. The next afternoon, I drove the Datsun to the woman's place on Rose Street so she could see if she wanted it. Though a bit battered, the station wagon's turquoise paint job had held up and could be detected under the rust and dust. Because of its color, we called it the engine car. Shortly after my sister Wren returned to California, she and I took the engine up into the Sierra to go camping. Wren treated that vehicle like a Jeep, taking it over rough back roads, through creek beds and muddy washes. We found a forest service road that led to a small meadow surrounded by ponderosa pine and sagebrush at the edge of nowhere. We made a campsite, heated up some beans on the Coleman stove, and built a small fire to keep warm. Soon the stars came out, the night got chilly. When we ran out of stories, we let the fire burn down and rolled out our sleeping bags. It isn't fair to keep my money, the woman is saying. Her voice is louder. She's beginning to cry. The car is broken. I'm stuck here in this town. Please. Months after our camping trip, Bren gave the vehicle to me. She had commuted in it for two semesters, back and forth from our home in the Berkeley Hills to Cal State Hayward, where she was studying ornithology. My sister kept her gear in the back, charred cooking pots, the cook stove, a sleeping bag, hiking boots, some field guides, and a tattered Mexican blanket she'd found in the desert. I had inherited some of this stuff when she gave me the car. Meanwhile, Wren had acquired a new man. He was a sweet, quiet guy who drove a long white Ford sedan with a red interior. It had been his family's car. He called it White Fang. Wait a minute, I tell her. What is it? Dad calls across the table. I put my hand over the receiver. The lady I sold the Datsun to, she wants her money back. Dad says nothing for a moment. Tell her you've already spent it. I consider this. The pill, bills she paid me are still in my wallet, but I'm saving the money to buy a Martin mandolin. With the sale of the engine car, I have just enough to go to the fifth string tomorrow and purchase that instrument. Telling the lady I've already spent the money is a lie, but I've wanted that sweet-sounding mandolin a long time. Listen, I tell the lady, I can't give that money back. It's not mine anymore. It's gone, spent. I hear her take this in. Oh, she cries. She's sobbing. But you sold me a piece of junk. It's a rotten car. I'm really sorry. I do feel contrite. I, I told you it had a lot of miles, but I reasoned that Datsun was still running when you bought it. You drove it. You decided. It's not my fault that the car broke down, and now the money you paid me is gone. I'm sorry. Her tears stop. She's sniffling. I hear her draw in her breath. She's silent a moment. I fidget, anxious for the conversation to end. My family has begun eating supper. I can hear them discussing the engine car. Wren is laughing about the number of times she ran out of gas because the gauge didn't work. Suddenly, the woman snaps. You cheated me. It's not fair. And she slams the receiver into its cradle. I feel terrible. Who was to know that the car would die so soon after changing hands? I loved that car, had driven it all kinds of places where, it's true, it had run out of gas and had even gone kaput so that my dad had to come tow me using our old pickup truck. On rainy days last fall, I had held my girlfriend in my arms in that engine car and had kissed her passionately. It was a great car, a turquoise gem. Thank you very much.